Now, now that we have that piece of machinery of state space and state vectors, we can now talk about a very important new concept, which is the concept we're going to be following very closely, and that is the concept of change. So if the state of the system at a point in time is a point in state space, which I will show with a red dot to say that the system right now is at this point in state space. What is it going to look like later? Well, it's going to look like another point in state space. And over time, the system will have moved from that point to that point. So let's call this x1 at time t1, and then this is x2 at time t2. Later on, it's going to be at another point. Later on, it's going to be at another point. And the whole game is going to be to figure out what is the path that the system takes. But in the meantime, we can agree that what change is, just descriptively, is change is a path through state space. And it's going to go wherever it's going to go. And our job later on is to figure out what makes it go here rather than there. But this is the description of change. Change, and I'll just even write it down, change is a trajectory through state space. Let's look at a couple of examples just to illustrate how powerful this technique is. First of all, let's take one of our Romeo and Juliet examples. So here's Juliet's love for Romeo. Here's Romeo's love for Juliet. Uh, and I'm just going to write that down. R equals Romeo's love for Juliet, again, as always, at time t, and j equals Juliet's love for Romeo, again, at time t. And let's suppose that at one point, this couple was at this point. So remember, in the Romeo and Juliet example, Positive values denote love. Negative values denote hate. So we can label this point. We know what this is. This is a point LL. Juliet loves Romeo because the J value is positive, And Romeo loves Juliet because the R value is positive. Now, over time, things happen, as you know. And the couple ends up here. And let's not ask why. This is not the time to ask why. We're just describing right now. Let's say the couple ends up there and that they went on that trajectory here. So what has happened? Well, we know what this second point means. The J value is still positive, but the R value is now negative. So we are in a Juliet loves Romeo, but Romeo hates Juliet. Maybe further on, the system continues to evolve, and it evolves to this point. And what does that point mean? It means J is negative and R is negative, and so we are now in hate-hate. They each hate each other. Where does it go from there? No idea. It depends on the details, on the model, on the dynamics of the interrelation between these couples. So this is just a simple example of the idea that change is a trajectory through state space. Now, right away, the minute that we say change is a trajectory through state space, all kinds of interesting questions can be asked 
that you might not think to ask in another representation, which is, what is the shape of the trajectory? Where is it going? What does the shape of the trajectory tell us about the interactions between Romeo and Juliet? So everyone is used to seeing presentations of systems in terms of what we learn to call time series, where things go up and down and they go whether they go, but here is time and here is the x value. And we all know how to interpret graphs that are functions of time. What I want to talk about is the relationship between graphs like this, which are functions of time, and these state space trajectories, which are not written as functions of time, where you just see the path of the state point. And going back and forth between the time series representation and the state space representation is a very interesting and important skill. And we definitely need to talk about that and to develop it. You'll see a bunch of examples in the text, exercises in the text, asking you to do that for various systems. Let me do one for you just to illustrate how this works. So we looked at the shark tuna system, and we saw that in the shark tuna system, if this is sharks and this is tuna, that we get a trajectory that looks kind of like this. And now the question is, what does this have to say about the interactions of the sharks and the tuna? So let's get the two time series for sharks and tuna, those two time graphs. Let's get them out of this figure. So the first thing we need to do is we need to choose a starting point. I'm just going to choose this as the starting point. And then I'm going to draw two time graphs, one of which is the shark and the other of which is the tuna. So at this green dot, which I'm going to call time zero, where is S? Answer, S is at its maximum value. It's the biggest value it's going to be. So let's take a nice big value for S right there. Then what's going to happen over time? Well, we saw that time is going this way. And so from this point, S is now going to decrease. It's going to decrease, decrease, decrease. So let's have S decrease, decrease, decrease. Then S is going to stay low. Remember that this region here is low S. So we're going to stay in the low S region for quite some time until S starts to increase again. And then S does indeed start to increase again until it comes back to the green dot at the end. And that completes this excursion in S. Now what about T? Well, at that same initial point, you'll notice that T was at its minimum value. T is as low as it is ever going to be. And so let's have T at a minimum value here at that same starting point. And then what happens to T is pretty much nothing. <laughs> During this whole epoch, here, while the state point is going to the left, T is staying at its low value. And T does not start to rise until S has hit its minimum. So at the minimum of S here, we're going to have T start to rise. 
and then T continues to rise all the time while S is still very low, T rises. And then when T is at its maximum, T begins to decline and S begins to increase. And so we get a curve that looks like that. And so that's how to get the two one-dimensional time series out of the two-dimensional plot. If we wrote them both on the same graph, they would look like this. And you see that they are out of phase with each other. So what have we done? We have laid out a very basic set of machinery. And again, to put it in the algebra and the geometry, we have the first key concept is the concept of the state vector. The first concept we have is the concept of the state vector, and that is the state vector x, y, z, whatever. And geometrically, that corresponds to a point in state space. And this is the point right there, which is the point x, and this is three-dimensional state space, so this is the point x, y, z. The second piece of machinery is we talked about adding vectors and multiplying a vector by a scalar. And we saw what that means geometrically. It means taking the two vectors and just adding them tip to tail. And then the resultant vector here is the vector x1 plus x2, or rather x1 y1 plus x2 y2 is the resultant red vector. And when we multiply a vector by a scalar, uh, that amounts to taking that vector and either stretching it or shrinking it, depending upon whether A is bigger than 1 or not, in the same direction. And then the third piece of structure that we developed is the answer to the question, how do we represent change? Change is a trajectory through state space.